Hello, everyone. We're about to turn around and let you all uh, hear a song by K Kiana. And we will be back with you all in just a moment. Okay, now that is from our younger sister, Kiana, and the no name of that is called Many Stories. Now, it's a full song. That was just a snippet yes. from the actual song, but the song itself, if you take the time to actually Sorry. Uh, listen to the lyrics of the song, you will realize just how multidimensional she definitely is. She is as an artist, but that song in particular as well, because it talks about I've been running all my life. You're talking about all the different, and it kind of ties in with what we're dealing with on today, you know, as it relates to, you know, all of the different facets of, our lives and mm -hmm. how, you know, everything kind of falls in and fits in. But, you know, I want everybody, I know, you know, you see me, you see Key, but then there's another face on the screen that you all may not be familiar with. And I'm going to have Key introduce this gentleman and do not tell that story. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> so I want you all to, and uh, you know, all of our, our our usual, you know, viewers, and then anyone who may be new. Um, this person is is a huge part of my life, especially growing up. Like we grew up neck and neck from like me highs. This is my god brother. This is my love. Um, we. I mean, when I say this is truly my heart, like I, I'm seriously like he could call me and be like, hey, I need and I'm, you know, he's one of those people that I'm going to be like, OK, let's make it happen. Um, grew up together, yeah. got in trouble together, <laughs> got in trouble together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to tell me you used to beat me up. <laughs> Listen, I used to beat him with Barbies. That's what she was saying not to tell. <laughs> he said it first. He said it. I didn't say it. So he said it. Um, <laughs> this is my love. This is my god brother, Paul. All right. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Glad Welcome, to be here. Paul. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah. Everything. Kenyatta said we we grew up together, um, and she did used to beat me up when I was a kid all the time. <laughs> Stop the violence. Violence. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ooh, I know she did. The pot called the kettle black. Uh -huh. And a few other colors. Look here. See. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Miss Kimberly. How are you this evening? Hey, Green. How are you? Good to have you with us. Um, well, we're going to just go ahead and jump in. Yeah. Um, the title says it all The Awakening. Accountability versus cancel culture. Are you woke? <laughs> no, I'm so sleepy. I'm a little woke? sleep deprived, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much. I'm to... You know, let's start out by just discussing one what it means to be woke, and I defer. I'll let him have that yeah. one. 
You know, it's a, that's a funny one. Um, my wife and I, we were in a diner not too long ago, or having dinner somewhere, and the lady at the table next to us um, was complaining. There's two older white ladies, and one of them was complaining that her kids didn't visit her anymore, and the other one said, yeah, they're just woke now. I hate that word, woke. And um, it was interesting to me to hear, like, this from this lady's, you know, I, I almost wanted to ask her, like, I was eavesdropping, but I was wanted to ask her, like, what does that word even mean to you? First of all, it's interesting to hear it come out of this older white lady's mouth, but uh, it's just one of those words that has attached so much meaning, you know, to it now that um, I think you almost have to start by saying, like, what does it mean to be woke? Like, what what does it, when folks say I'm woke, what does that mean? What do you guys think? Yeah, what does it mean? Well, I'm asking you. You presented the question, so now from, I'm asking you. Using. From... A well, let me start. Let me preface what I'm going to say with the way that it is often used, as we kind of hit on a little bit behind the scenes, is politicians, politicians have taken the word and and politicized it. They have taken it and they have started to skew it to fit their narrative. Um, Now, for the people that I deal with that tend to say, you know, talk about the quote unquote woke culture, it's basically speaking in terms of being aware of your heritage, your history, your lineage, and things of that nature, mm-hmm. you know, um, from a spiritual standpoint, knowing where things, you know, have derived from, from a spiritual standpoint, how we have gone from, you know, point A millions of years ago up until this point. Yeah. And so for me, when I hear the term being woke, it has nothing to do with BLM, it has nothing to do with, you know, any of the the stuff that's going on politically. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with people understanding true history, Mm -hmm. not black history, but history. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be true, you can't be a true historian without understanding the depths that melanated people have, how the depths to which melanated people have impacted, not just the US, but this world, Mm -hmm. period, point blank. And that's my stance on it. Kimberly says, um, being aware of hidden agendas that many were not conscious of. Absolutely. And that's yeah. it in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you to know? me, it's just like saying you're, like, you're not asleep. Like most, a lot of people just kind of, you, you can walk through the program of life and just be like sleep basically as to what's going on. Mm-hmm. And to be woke means like you're awake as to what's going on around you and not just like following, blindly following the program anymore and I, I do think like we have turned the corner in this society a little bit where people are you know for for so long in america there's like the propaganda textbooks the propaganda news stories etc that just tell like this really sanitized narrative of like what has happened and how did we get here and i think what you've seen for for really like a long time but basically coming to a head last summer with black lives matter etc is everybody you know including white people a generation of white people saying um you know what i'm questioning what has been taught to me at this point and i'm not just blindly following the program anymore and then unfortunately i think you see the backlash you know just yesterday actually at uh, tennessee passed this law that said it's uh, they're going to remove funding from schools that teach systemic racism and critical race theory. And so you see a backlash of people that are saying, like, I don't want you to not run that, you know, pattern or program anymore. I want you to stick with the script. And you you see, you know, the people that stormed the Capitol were mad because 
the vote indicated that people were not sticking to the script. And so, you know, it, it almost begs the question of why is there such a backlash against people opting not to stick to the script? Who, who's benefiting from people sticking to the script? Ah, the oppressors, obviously. Because those of us who are just like, uh, yeah, no, we're not falling for that. You know, yeah. like, because I know one of the things that, that absolutely positively has irked me. And so um, I know your daughters are very, very culturally aware. Um, but with my own daughter, you know, she would, I would, I because she was studying um, AP, U.S. History, and um, so we, were, I would sit there and I'm like helping her study and I'm going through these books and I'm going through these lessons with her. And so as we're going through these books and as we're going through these lessons, and, you know, of course, these are, you know, the, the history books that they want us, you know, AP U.S. History. So then I'm going, OK, well, let me give you the addendum to this story. So let me tell you the other side of this. Let me tell you the backstory. Let me tell you the resulting you know, right. from this. So, you know, when she finally, when she wrote her final paper, it, it was a little controversial because, <laughs> <laughs> because she's just like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not it. That's, right. you know, right. there's more to the story. Let me tell you about this, that, and the third, you know, and the history teacher was like, um, this was not a part of the assignment. Yes, it was. <laughs> it didn't come out the way that you thought it was going to come out. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of like the time we live in. Like, think about when we were kids, right? You, you had a textbook that got approved by a whole, you know, panel of people that told the story. And then you had a, a set of encyclopedias that was very static, might get updated every five years. And so for the most part, unless you went actively looking at like a black bookstore or a conscious bookstore, you, you really didn't get anything other than a very well vetted narrative. But now because of the availability of the internet, social media, people's connectedness, you, you have the ability to get a perspective that's beyond just what was in those curated books. And then not only that, you have the opportunity to hear from people real time as to what their experiences are or what their reaction to a news story is. Like I, I work a very corporate job. So when, when George Floyd incident happened, they, there was a panel, fortunately the president of the company like saw what was going on and, and wanted to address it. There was a panel of black senior leaders at the company, and we all spoke very openly about racism, both you know overt and then microaggressions that we are dealing with like all the time. And for a lot of my work colleagues, that was the first time that they were hearing that from like corporate black people that they you know they they felt like that oh that happens over there. He was selling cigarettes, some you know you must have done something. But there's people that they know intimately because they work with us every day. They've traveled with us and stuff like that. And they, you know, on business travel and stuff like that. So they feel they know us. Right. And then we're telling them, like, right. no, this is happening. And so now now you have the ability to connect. And people heard those stories first firsthand. And I think it was an eye opener for, for a lot of them. And then that, that was like a global that, that it was a, a panel, but it was broadcast globally. So you have people on in, in Switzerland who were like, oh, what? It's really like that in America? Who set up meetings with me to be like, talk to me about this yeah. some more. So that level of connectivity is, think about how far removed that is from the scripted textbook and your set of encyclopedias, you know what I mean? So I think it's inevitable that people will become more conscious and more aware uh, as we move forward. Absolutely. Well, the funny part, you know, you were talking about the textbooks of old, even when I was in school, with those textbooks of old, I was that controversial student for Coach Smiley in civics. Yes, I even remember the teacher, the, you know, the whole nine. Um, because when he would, um, when certain things would come up, I would have to let them know, no, that's a hock of crock. And I'm, you know, I'm thankful for his for his class because in a lot of classes, you weren't able to really speak up. Mm -hmm. It was like, this is what's in the textbook and this is how it is. Mm -hmm. But there, you know, we were able to say no, yes, whatever. But the blessed part for me was the fact that I got the opportunity to sit at the feet of my great grandmother my grandparents who lived through a lot of what 
was being taught about Jim Crow South mm -hmm. that lived in the area where Emmett Till was murdered, who was who knew the families of these, you know, in, you know these individuals and all of this stuff, you know, so it, it's, you know, so for me, I was able to, you know, when certain things would come up, I'd be like, that's bull crap. Just to, that was bull crap. And then I would tell them, you know, like when they would talk about, you know, whitewashing the history. And I was like, look, what you all are talking about with these, um, what's the word that they always use for the, um, the, um, it's not ancestors. It's um, forefathers. It, uh, it's their heritage. You know when they're talking about their heritage, and I have to tell them, uh, well, your heritage is all good. Mine is as well. But what you need to understand is the fact that, excuse me, what you need to understand is the fact that um, that while all of this is well and good and what you're dealing with is, and you're saying what's in the textbook, the textbook is not accurate. Those were some of my family members hanging from those trees. My family, we talked and we were taught about how things really were during those times mm -hmm. because great grandma lived to be you know, well up in age. Mm -hmm. Then my grandparents lived to be, you know, of a substantial age. So, heck, my parents, my father would have been in his late 80s at this point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one of those deals where you can't come to me with the okie doke. And I would go home, my mom was an educator, and she was like, baby, because I would moan and groan. She said, put on that test what's in that book, but you know the truth. Mm -hmm. She said, give them the answer that they want because you need the grade. Oh, excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. you need you. the grade. So give them the answer that they want. Yeah. But you've done what you were supposed to do. You've told them that it was a this ain't that. This ain't that. Okay, now Kimberly says the truth has been revealed as Paul stated. The propaganda is no longer reality and falsehoods are being called out. We were never to share our stories nor the truth being told. OMG, this show, I love it. We love you too and we appreciate your support. So I know you're putting up um, mm -hmm. comments. But when we talk about the truth being told, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, the, the great grandparents and the grandparents or whatever. But and again, I'm going back to my own because for me, this has been the manifestation of, of years of, you know, input in this and any other. So when she had to do another one of her her um, her because she had all pre college courses. So when she had to do another one and. So in the, the project that she that she worked on was from my parents era. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and she talked about in her actual project that, you know, my mom was one of the ones that was out there, you know, launching rocks at the police at the time while Grandma. she was in her grandmother. And I said my mom. OK, yeah. Um, was out there, you know, launching rocks at the police, you know, you know, talk, you know, and, and protesting the police down at Tennessee State, mm -hmm. you know, when they tried to come up, you know, up on, on the campus for whatever reason. So and, and she talked about seeing um, Dr. King and, and you know, and, and the whole impact of that. So my daughter, she showed up. She had on some stacks. That she had on bell bottoms. She had on this big, she had on a dash. You, you would have been proud. I would have been proud. Posted. Yeah, you could have posted a picture. She, she, posted a picture. <laughs> she took it back, so she had to. She had the dashiki, and she went up in there. She walked in there. She was carrying her project. She walked in there with that fist raised. She walked right. in there. They were just like, "Oh Lord, what are we getting ready to get into?" <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and that comes from sitting at the feet of my parents. That comes from talking to my grandparents. That comes from looking at the book and going, okay, and she's always been that way. She's always been very analytical. That's a scientist in her. And so she's like, okay, so this is what this says, but 
So what else happened? It's like this doesn't right. make sense. Or what's what's the in between? So I think even when we talk about um, woke, I think one of the things that amazes me is that this generation that we produced, because even his uh, his his daughters are all named after like amazing black women, like they and they live they 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 honor their names, they they hold they they hold it down. Yeah, but. I think that this generation that, that we have produced, they have their faults. Like they drive us absolutely positively bananas. Mm-hmm. But when we talk about being woke, these jokers are like, yeah, no, that ain't it. You yeah. can tell me that, but this is the other part of that. Or I think that's a big it. difference too. Like, sorry yeah, to cut you off, but I think that's a big difference too. Like how you were saying, like your 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 mom and grandma said, like put on the paper what you what's going to get you by, so that you know you get through. And I think that's largely how we were raised. I think the younger generation is like, no, I'm not putting that on the paper because number one, the 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 system broadly, like in some ways, like it failed them. Like they don't have necessarily the career progression. They don't necessarily have the opportunity. They they have the opportunities, but it's a different economy. They've seen, you know, the whole offshoring of jobs, everything. So the reward that you get from towing the line is not as guaranteed, first of all. And then second, I don't know why. They just have more heart. They, they, they do not believe in that idea of just put the, put what's on the paper in order to get by. They're like, no, this is this is the truth and I'm standing in it. Like, you know, for lack of for people fault millennials and, and the young Gen Z because they're not necessarily like following that path. But there's a benefit there because they're, they're living in their today reality yeah. truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think that's helpful. And, and the thing that I think is unnerving people is that's not just black people anymore. E- even now, yeah. even in response yeah. to the yeah. anti-Asian violence, right? Like um, Asians have historically been um, stereotyped as the model minority. I, I have a lot of close Asian friends who will tell you that their parents have told them like, just put your head down and focus on excellence and achieving and you'll get beyond it. And that's been the model up to this point. But even now, Asians are like, no, dude, you white people, you need to stop, like white racists, I should say. I don't mean just white people, you're white racists. Mm-hmm. You need to like stop that. Like well, they're not taking it anymore. So I think just in general, people are done going along to get along, you know, right. and, and it's, it's changing the game. I, I have a question for you guys. What do you think about? Huh? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I was saying we're getting stronger with each generation. Sure, it's like sure. Each genera- like you know, the generation we're we're the descendants of the slaves that fought. Yeah, and then like their their you know their children right. held their fist up a little bit stronger than you know the grandparents, and then yeah. you know our parents, and now us, and then now you all's children. Yeah, so I tell you. So now we're, we're going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on and just slide on into the accountability portion of it because, you know, we talked about George Floyd and, you know, and, and, and the Black Lives Matter and all that has um, occurred and taken place and all, you know, when they have said, you know, we're not doing this anymore, you know, and they're they're like, you know, we demand accountability because I'm going to tell you as much as the George Floyds were of our age group and, you know, of our generation and, and so many of the, you know, the, those who have, who have been, you know, executed by the police. Um, but it was those young people. It was our minds, you know, and it was, it was the strategy of our elders and it was, you know, in our minds, but it was those young people that were out there and they were like, no, right. we're done. Right. We're not taking this. You going to give us some answers well, we're going to raise a whole lot of hell. Y'all, right. ready, you know, we're getting ready to move. In a, and, and I see that now that, you know, there's, you know, yes, we we have applauded that George Floyd's murderer, and we will call him a murderer, that George Floyd's murderer, you know, got, you know, he got some time or whatever. And, you know, so some folks are just like, OK, but that was just for show. They had to give us something. But even if that is the case, these young people are still not content. Hmm. And with yeah. them not being content, now we move into the accountability because now they're like, okay, yeah, that's nice. We still got work to do. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Great point. Let me ask you guys: Is there such a thing as like too woke? You know, being being like quote unquote too woke. Yes. 
All right, say more. My inbox, and I'd be like, eh, no, stop that. Go away. Yeah. Go away. Just go away. <laughs> I don't go away. <laughs> because in see, for me, when you are one of those people that are too woke, you are just as bad as the ones that are pushing propaganda from the opposite side. Mm -hmm. Because nothing is complete, completely white. Nothing is completely black. Mm -hmm. It's like everything has an exception. Mm -hmm. Everything has a narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a reason behind whatever. You know, and Sis is talking about the um you know the accountability of the um of the George Floyd murder, you know, when you were talking about how the, the young people are not satisfied just with that, you know, because okay, yes, we all exhaled because we knew the world and this country in particular was waiting on the Rodney King revolt. We were waiting on that post Rodney King revolt because we never get justice. Nothing is new. It's just finally being recorded. Mm. It's finally being recorded and reported yeah. to, yeah, you know, to the public. Right, right. Great point. Because you know, I know several people who are former police officers from back in the day and they would talk about all of the corruption. Mm -hmm. Like Today, uh, my husband sent me an article about a um, about a uh, officer down in Louisiana, and I'll put it in the thread um, that came forth about um, that came forth about um, trying to find it. Um, where is he at? Oh, right here. Me? Okay. Uh, yeah, it was like this uh, black officer. He actually came out and called out the officers that planted drugs, stole evidence, um, oh, and yeah. made trumped up charges. And they were talking about hundreds of cases were uh, dismissed as a result of him coming forward. And back in the day, that was something you didn't do. They talk yeah. about the silent cold the, of the streets. Yeah, the blue, the, mm -hmm. but that, that blue was, line. Blue walls, yeah. yeah. But you know, it's, to make people comfortable, like you know, uh, George Floyd's murderer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, the funny thing of it, it's so systemic because, like, I saw that article as well, and it talked about like the headline was something along the lines of like corrupt, uh, you know, corrupt officers, and it, it talked to like bribery, theft, planning drugs, etc. But the photo that went along with that article was actually the article, the, the the brother who came forward and so you you see like all like it's, it's it's so persistent like even in a thing like that where it's an article about justice and this person has done the, the thing right for somebody that looks at that headline all you see is corrupt officer and then the picture of this black officer's face so it, it's like so pervasive as to clearly be like intentional you know yeah it wasn't even a good picture it was a picture that was meant right to make him look bad Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly. Like he, he looked like the the culprit as opposed to yeah. the the hero of the story. So it, it's just interesting. Like, um, you know, but I think more and more people are becoming aware of those, you know, those types of things. So it'll be yeah. interesting. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk about the cancel culture versus the accountability culture. Everybody and everything is being canceled. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what's what's the is it is it being uh, like the title? Is it being can canceled or is it being held accountable? Like, if you did some heinous stuff back in the day and you get called on it, are, are you being canceled? Or are you being held accountable? Or like, there's a lot of stuff that like used to be the norm, and now people are saying that's not acceptable anymore. You know, like you take the Me Too movement or Harvey Weinstein, for example. This, this, I'm, I guarantee he wasn't the only one. Bill Cosby wasn't the only one. This, this was like the norm of Hollywood and everyone knew it. There's jokes about it, everything. And, and so 
at some point somebody put a line in the sand and said like this is not acceptable anymore so did those folks get canceled or they got held accountable for something that they should not have been doing in the first place mm-hmm. all of the above mm-hmm. right uh, because mr cosby was vilified ostracized i mean drug through the mud now what he did was not right so I'm not, you know, saying that because he actually said, you know, that was just the way things were mm-hmm. at that time. So I'm not saying he was right in any shape, form or fashion. But I will say the double standard by which he was held versus old boy from Seventh Heaven. Uh, I can't think of uh, the one that played the father on that television show. Seventh. Oh, Heaven. Oh, yeah. The Duger. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. then uh, Josh Duger, you know, that even dealt with his own sit. Okay, um, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, you know, and all of the different things that um, were going on with them, and then, like you said, the Harvey Weinstein's and the, you know, everybody trying to give, you know, them the slaps on the wrist mm-hmm. for doing the same thing Mr. Cosby did, and it's it's like, okay, yeah. Accountability is good, but if you're going to hold this black man to this standard. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't agree with that. I'll be honest with you. I don't agree with that because I, I feel like you, you can't set your bar at the lowest common denominator. Like, I, I agree with it. First of all, that um, Bill Cosby was was definitely had more repercussions and more accountability than other folks. But like... You know, I don't know what the word is, but like when you're in the mud, you're in the mud. It doesn't matter how deep in the mud you are. Right, so right. if it, at that point, you know, there's there's not degrees of heinous behavior. You know what I mean? Heinous behavior is That's heinous it. behavior. So and and I don't think that we I think it's a dangerous thing for us as black people to do. I know we always want to defend our own and we also always want to call out the double standard and the double standard is real. But I mm-hmm. feel like there's enough. um times when black people are villainized for things that are legitimate, you know, or, or black people are, are um, being, you know, unfairly prosecuted for things that are legitimate, that I, I would not waste a half a breath to defend a black person who has actually legitimately done some bad shit. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm not defending what he's done, but what mm-hmm. I was doing was actually saying exactly what you said better than I said it. You know, if you're in the mud, you're in the mud. But if you turn around and hold Mr. Cosby to this standard, then you need to hold the Harvey Weinsteins to that same standard. Standard, And if you're going to cancel Mr. Cosby, you need to cancel Mr. Weinstein. You don't need to different. Between, you don't need to differentiate between the two. And that's what you said a lot better than what I was saying is exactly, you know, there there is, there, there should not be. No. There should not be. And as far as the cancel culture, people need to understand you only get canceled when it's warranted. But being canceled and being held accountable Back to George Floyd and his murderer. Mm -hmm. His murderer was held accountable. Right. But did that family truly receive justice? Yeah, yeah. And I guess the bigger question, too, is like the accountability should be there in order to solve the problem. So even in the case of Derek Chauvin, when he got prosecuted, okay, yeah, you prosecuted him, but there's no steps taken yet. There's some discussion about it, which is encouraging, but there's no steps taken yet to really solve the root cause of the problem. You know, that he felt comfortable to keep his hands in his pocket on this man's neck because he knew that that was part of the norm of the culture that he was working in. And you could see that when he got convicted, he was shocked. He was legit shocked, like, because he did not expect, I don't think, to be held accountable because that's like what he was living in. His brothers in blue were... And he he was comfortable because he knew that his brothers in blue had his back as the people were trying to tell him, you know, what was what. Yeah, they he wasn't trying to hear because his boys in blue were holding him up in his wrong. Yeah. So now they're waiting their day in court. 
Yeah. But let me ask you guys, like, just like, those are like the Cosby, Derek Chauvin, all these, these are like extreme examples, but let's think about this notion of cancel culture and some of the more nuanced things. So like take um, Dave Chappelle. So Dave Chappelle tells these transgender jokes and he gets, you know, potentially slammed for it. And, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I consider myself a strong ally of LGBTQ and trans, you know, transgender folks. However, um, it, it, is there a case where people are starting to get so sensitive that you're actually removing the ability to have a constructive dialogue? Like part of the way that I became an ally for LGBTQ folks is that I had LGBTQ friends who tolerated my dumbass questions. You know, like like they tolerated me bumbling through conversations around their reality in a way that, you know, if, if I felt like I might potentially get canceled, because, you know, some of these friends were coworkers, right? So if I felt I was going to get canceled by having this conversation, I would have never come to the realization. Uh, one of the things I say on my job all the time is I, you can consider me the risk-free Black person. Ask me any question about Black people. And if you're in a good place, I'm going to answer that question because I don't want you to sit there ignorant because you were afraid to ask the question. So do you think that we might have gone so far, particularly with public figures or even in terms of how we interact with each other, that people are missing the opportunity to learn because they're worried about getting canceled? Absolutely. Absolutely. How can we solve that? Stop being sensitive at such sensitive asses. Okay. Now, see, and I can say that. I can say we should stop being such sensitive asses. Because we, because we came up in an era where, like you were talking about, um, uh, what's the uh, the comic? You just said it. They should yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, we came up in an era where he had, he was following in the footsteps of the Robin right. Harris's right. Mm-hmm. and the Robin Harris's were following in the footsteps of the Dolomites and the Richard Pryors and the Red Foxes, and they were very unfiltered. Right. They were some of the most unfiltered. Mm-hmm. You know, those are just a few, you know, and we're not going to talk about some of the female comics like some more. Moms, maybe. Uh, moms, May- yeah, we're, you know, yeah. some more and Monique and you know, moms, you know, all of them. And Martin and uh, uh, what's Eddie Griffith? You know, we look nowadays, people are going back to 1990, finding jokes that were told because people have become so ultra sensitive. Mm-hmm. Now, like you just said, if people were, if you don't understand something, the best way to get an understanding is to ask a question. Because a lot of times we have people in our own families, in our own personal circles, who are afraid to come forth about the lifestyle that is authentically who they are because of fear of judgment, because of fear of being quote unquote canceled ostracized. Uh, that's it. Yeah, especially within their own families and communities, ostracized. Mm-hmm. Like there are, and I can speak on my life. There are certain aspects of my life that I don't discuss with certain people because I know that they will be like, "What the hell?" Mm-hmm. You know, and and th- that'll be a done deal, right? So. That, you know, and and Kevin Hart, that was a a prime example. Kevin Hart was supposed to do one of the award shows. And they went back 10 years Mm -hmm. when he was a nobody comic. And he made some one joke. And it was just this one joke that he told on two occasions. And they just, they ran with it. They tried to rush, you know, run roughshod over over his whole entire career and he was he did not end up doing the award show and all of that because of a joke that he told two times 10 years ago mm-hmm. that's what i was saying and it's just like and they were just like no 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 you know we're done with we're done with kevin hart we you know 
That's it. Yeah. That's it. Just, the Kevin Hart one, the, the only thing that's interesting about that is like, it, the reason why they didn't let him do the show is because he refused to apologize for the joke. So like, if he, if he said, for example, like, I, I don't want people hold me to things I said 10 years ago, even last year, last week, maybe. So, because you grow as you go. And so Absolutely. if someone were to call you on it and be, and you were to be like, you know what, my bad, I was, I wouldn't do that today because I learned and I grew. He, what he did was double down and was like, I refuse to apologize because I said it. And then, you know, in the end, he ended up like apologizing anyway, but he, he could have used it as a moment to be like, you know what? I said that I didn't understand. Now I understand. And but he did in he did. later interviews, in interviews, yeah. You know, he said that he said, you know, I told the jokes. I did. I have learned. I have, you know, I have come to a different understanding since then. You know, I have different sensitivities since then. Right. But yeah, I told it. Yeah. I'm not going to apologize. He owned, he owned what he did. He owned it. He was just like, okay, I said it. Y'all want me to apologize, you know, for, for, you know, what I was saying and what I believed at that point in time, even though I may not feel that same way now, no. Right, right. Yeah, but that's he, true. He did, he did say, you know, this, you know, what is it, art, artistic creativity, you know, and, and just the fact that he said what I knew and what I felt then does not equate to what I know and feel now. Because we all had some some very insensitive yeah. stuff. We mm. all oh, yeah, at some sure. point from because ooh, this mouth here, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel bad for kids been... today. I feel bad for young people because they have like like I, I recently I've been packing up a bunch of stuff. So I found like all my like pictures from all like going back to the early nineties. And like this is when you only had like twenty four pictures, right? And and there's stuff in there. I'm like, Jesus, I hope these, you know, thank God these been in the box. But imagine like where everybody has a camera and it's immediately broadcast and there's facial searches and your future employer can go and be like, oh, I saw you, you know, doing whatever at Freak Nick 94. You know, that's that's I couldn't imagine it, like the, the, the challenge that kids live under today. You know what I'm saying? It's it's, it's tough. Can it's I go back to school? Wait a minute, hold on. Can I go back it's to like, It's like kids today can't even breathe right. No. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, I don't know what it's going to mean for them. Like, they, I mean, they could try to toe the line or they could go the other way and just be like, I'm just doing me, you know, whatever. I don't know how, how. it'll be interesting to see how this plays out for them. Right, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the things that we've talked about is, you know, and it's, it's so glad that, you know, <laughs> we were in college and we lived our lives before pre social media. Pre social media. You know, mm-hmm. because we just you know, Yeah, it's a whole different situation. Like Like you see me on the hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were in college together. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Okay, that's funny. Um, yeah. so what, what about on a personal level? Like, how do you deal with this cancel culture? Like, I mean, there's the Dave Chappelle and Kevin Hart, but in your day-to-day life, how do you think this, the cancel culture like plays out just as you go through your day-to-day in addition and, you know, beyond just your social media and stuff like that? I could give a happy ham sandwich. <laughs> what is a happy ham sandwich? I have never heard that before. She can give two... <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, um, and I'm not saying that I'm insensitive to what people feel because, for me, being empathic, I tend to sometimes care too much. Uh-huh. But I have come to the point where. I've learned how to care, but not become consumed with situations. And a lot of times, like right now, today I was putting up a lot of different um, things dealing with relationships. Last night, you know, relationships and stuff were, were really, really on my mind, really heavy. So I woke up this morning with a lot of stuff on my brain. And so I just started posting things that had been on my head and it was 
kind of funny because, you know, I was I shared different things and, you know, from different people. You know, I had a couple of phone calls come in this morning from people and, you know, and so I just saw a post where, you know, a hit dog collared talking about people speaking on what they don't know and and this, that, and the third. And see, and so I'm sitting here now, okay, D, do you respond or do you not? Do you respond or do you not? Do you respond or do you not? Because see, I know me. And if I respond, it may not be in the nicest um, manner. Sorry. You know, it may not be in a way that I'll say would well that would keep that yeah it would not keep down conflict yeah because so that, I would just basically be be like you know check your actions check yourself and you so wouldn't have to follow when that rock bust you in your face ah uh, all right all right you're serious that's a serious message. So let, let me ask you this. Do you think that there's a risk that you just really, by like, basically people are just disengaging. So to a certain extent, people are not really canceled. They're just moved to a different platform. So you're like moving, you're losing the opportunity for people to actually exchange ideas. So even you take like our last president and the fact that he got moved off of social media, did, are you really just basically removing the ability to see what this clown is thinking and, 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 as a result, you're not getting exposed to those ideas. Or like if you take like the channels of Fox versus CNBC, are you running into a, a situation where people are only getting the ideas that like reaffirm them? Yeah. What do you What do you guys and think? That, yeah, basically what it does, it's like, it's hilarious to me to watch um, CNN and Fox go back and forth like two fighting roosters. Right. You know, yeah. and and right now you've got Tucker Carson, who is the butt of all from Fox, uh, who is the butt of all jokes when it comes down to the news, because so because he is so extreme when it comes down to licking the crack of number 45 and everything that he stands for. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what Republican courts have said. It doesn't matter what Republican led states have said. It doesn't matter what, you know, any of these different uh, places and organizations or individuals have shown, you know, as far as the lack of evidence, like even with Rudy Giuliani and all the stuff that's going on with him and how things are unraveling. He is like, he is going to hold it. It's just like, okay, he got caught in the bed with the mistress, but because the person looked like me, but you didn't see my my license that was in my wallet, you don't know if that was me or a body double. Did, did he it's actually like, get caught in the bed with the mistress? Or are you just using that figuratively? As an example. You know, yeah. uh, but like one of those where I'm going to hold on to my lie. Right. Until as long as it is. My dying day. Yeah. But you guys can remember at the beginning, and I don't want to dedicate too much time to Trump, but at, at the beginning um, of the Trump presidency, Kelly Con Kellyanne Conway, like one of her first press conferences, probably like literally three, what, three weeks in, introduced this concept of like, um, fake truth, or I forget the verb that, she, that, 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 that the way that she described it, but this whole idea that the truth is subjective and that, you know, they fake continued news. on that for the, no, not fake news. It was like, it was something like su subjective truth or something like that. It was not like fake news. They use that to dismiss everybody else, but it was the idea okay. that like yeah. he got caught in a lie and she was like, well, it's not a lie. It's like a subjective yeah. truth. And then they basically just roll yeah. with that going forward. So repeatedly, you know, they would get something that was obviously not a fact and they would just like stick with it. It's, it seems like one of the unfortunate outcomes of whether it's the accountability or the cancel culture, when people check out of the conversation, there's nobody there to 
you, you're no longer talking to each other to be able to hold each other accountable and be like, you know, that's bullshit. Like that, that, and that, as a result of that, you know, people just swallow. Alternative facts. Yeah, that was it. Alternative fact. Yeah. Yeah. And people like no longer can you really, you know, go. F- it's, it's, it's hard to um, have your, your beliefs challenged, you know. It's, it's like Absolutely. we were talking earlier about all the benefit of social media and electronic and connectivity, but there's a downside, you know, to it too, because you have these algorithms that are feeding you the, you know, it's like crack, they feed you what you want to, what you want to hear. And they keep having that. There, there's this magazine that I subscribe to called the week. And um, the whole, it, the whole purpose of the week is like, instead of one article, it takes snippets from like five different magazines that have different political bents. So it'd be like, this is the conservative paragraph. This is the liberal paragraph. This is the center. Or, or if there's a U.S. domestic issue, they take snippets from newspapers outside the U.S. and you, they'll say like, "This is how they see us." So they'll talk about you know the election. They'll be like, "This is how they see us." Um, so I, I, I subscribe to it online. So I've been getting it in print for years. Got it online, and all of a sudden, it just aligns with my politics, which counters the whole purpose of this of this of this publication in the first place so i feel like it's really hard at this point unless you really are proactive about it to hear perspectives that don't align with your own perspectives you know and and i think that's very very dangerous for us even even uh, even on the 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 left you know this one first so there were two comments that that i i i want to draw attention to because they're you know they kind of go hand in hand um so Frank Lazare says, exactly, and the larger issue with cancel culture, it associated with the left, it gives ammunition to the extreme right. Shantae says, the term culture is overused at this point. Most times it is used, it doesn't really apply. The chance for accountability should come first. If the actions or behavior continue, then it is what it is. So I was, I, I am not, I, I'm still like news and all that, you know, just as SD talked about being empathic. A majority of my news is because she brings my attention to it. Absolutely. I, I have no issue with saying that. I have so much going on. And then just being, Again, a very empathic person. Like, what's going on in the world? I have no clue about until she tells me, just because I just can't. And I give her the water down. Yes, yeah, she does because I I just can't not I cannot absorb anymore at this point in time. Just like emotionally saturated, mentally, you know, with my job, with my family, with everything that's going on, I am saturated. So she brings them attention. Did you see this news article? Or you might want to pay attention to this. Or you have you have you peeped this? Have you like I don't watch the news. I I just can't. I can't do it. But, excuse me, but one of the things um, that I don't even know how I stumbled upon it. I happened to be on Twitter, which I never do. I think I was looking at something that you posted. I don't do Twitter. It's another one. I just don't do it. But they were saying, you know, Kamala had made a comment about Kamala. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Kamala had made a comment about, supposedly had made a comment about um, racism no longer existing in America. And people were like, oh, no, she didn't know what she's talking about. We just need to cancel her all together. How the hell you going to cancel like that? First of all, exactly. How are you going to cancel the vice president? I'm sorry. First, black lady, you know, semi-black, but you know, first black lady, you know, it don't take two drops. So, you know, first black lady, you know, up in the office, you know, as, as VP. And, you know, first of all, what she said was misconstrued. Right. It was extremely out of context because right. even in that particular, in what, you know, racism no longer exists in America. So, you know, how when you quote something, you know, there's like the little dots because you don't want to put everything that was said before. And right. then, you know, there may be dots in between because you're going to pick up this piece of the conversation later. So what they did was with the statement, they took a piece of the statement, they put the little dots in there, and then they put took another piece of the statement. And so that's how they came up with this one statement that was so much mess. But when I tell you 
like I ended up following that whole little line and thread for probably about two days <laughs> because I was just like, are they really, are they really, are they really you know, like, you know, and I'm just like reading like all these little retarded comments and just insane stuff. True. Yeah. Um, yeah. Until it's just like, really, we're going to cancel Madam Vice President because y'all put some pieces of a sentence together to come up with something. So even with that, you know, we have to be careful because again, that goes back to the, you know, the, the, the cancel culture and wanting to just be like, Oh, this person did something wrong instead of saying, okay, Madam President, what did you mean by that? Yeah. Or did, is that what you actually said? Well, I have a question. So instead of saying well, what's real, we're just going to run with it. We're just going to run with the BS. And, and and that becomes a part of the cancel because we're just going to run with the BS. Yeah, that's a great point. Good example. While, while, while we hadn't canceled all of these people that uh, supported uh, January 6th. Because they don't look like us. That's still in office. Because they don't look like us. Okay. Yeah. And that's another I think thing that's that an interesting because we are quick to cancel our own. Yeah, I, I think one. The others. Yeah, I, th I think one thing that would be great is actually if we we almost like I think we spend a lot of time, and I, I understand why, but I think we, and when I say yes. we in this case, I mean Black Americans, like spend a lot of time being like hyper vigilant about. Um, What's the word? Like, I almost call it like being orthodoxy of blackness. Like, we spend a lot of time yeah. being, is this person fully mm -hmm. aligned with the black quote unquote agenda, whatever that's supposed to be? It's not even like we're monolithic. And then also spend a lot of time being prepared to be offended. And I, I think that it, it will be, if we, if you could bottle that energy and the effort and the brain power and the key clicks that are spent, like dealing with when someone has done something offensive and just, repurpose it for things that are proactively building and almost like let it let the other stuff roll off like water on a duck it would be powerful like everybody has a certain amount of of bandwidth to think about something or give energy to a thing if if you could like stop being offended stop being irritated stop being like canceling somebody and take all that energy and be like i'm building something let's let's focus together on how we build something I, I think that we would be in a very, very different place. But it's like, I, I get it. It's like so many centuries of being on the short end of the stick or on the receiving end of ill treatment. It conditions you to like always be like, have your guard up for when it's going to happen. It, it would be like almost superhuman for people to all just adjust. But if there was a way, if I had a wish or magic wand, it would be for people to adjust. Like if, if you if you think of like I can think of certain ethnic groups that moved to America, they seem unfazed by America. East Africans, they move here, they seem very un unfazed by anything going on in America. They are setting up businesses and they don't care what you think of them. Um, there's other ethnic groups, Hasidic Jews, they do not think they don't care what anybody has to say. They protect themselves and then they focus on building on them themselves. I, I would love to see black Americans adopt that ethos. I don't know how it could happen. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But I know that in my life, in the things that I do, in the way that I move, even in my personal life, I am all about community building. So I am all about um, what can we do to better each other? What can we do to strengthen each other? You know, what can we do, you know, even in our own little group to build to better, you know, to to promote who we are, you know, as a culture, but then just, you know, all across the board, you know, not just because we look like us, but, you know, just all across the board, but specifically, 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 <laughs> because I'm, you know, I want us to be able to come together and to not be at odds with one another and to just be able to say, hey, you know, I love you. I support you. Let's build together. And that is like, like I said, when I talk about my life, when I talk about my personal life, when I talk about my romantic life, all of, you know, everything I do in my life at this point is all about connections, networking and community building. It just is. I mean, down to the job that I currently have, you know, there are people who have jobs because of my network, because of the things that I have done, you know, so I've made sure that, you know, I have this position. I am in this position. So let me 
take my position and to help you to build on what it is that you have. And I think if we could all get to a point, if we could, and, and I'm not even saying all because not all of us are going to go there, but if we could get to a point as individuals and just make it a, a, a purposeful, you know, a purpose, purposeful mindset to do that, a purposeful yeah. mindset to help one another instead of stepping over each other, instead of running each other over, instead of dismissing one another, being like, okay, well, let me help you learn something. Let me help you build. Let's build together. Then I think that, you know, we could probably move towards being in a better situation than we currently are. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I, okay, speaking of building, unfortunately, I, I need to. I work with a group of black boys, and uh, we have a, a, a lesson tonight that um, is about to start in a few minutes. So, yeah, I need and to. That's what um, I was just about to say. Well, we, we appreciate you coming <laughs> no, and joining pleasure. us. Yeah, we appreciate you. And, you know, we can definitely keep the thread going from the video, but we thank you for taking your time to come share with us on this thing called life. And for those of you that are watching, take care. Uh, Mr. Paul, we appreciate you. Oh, it's my Bye pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It's an honor to, be, uh, honor to be invited. Thank you so much. If you invite me, I'm uh -huh. here. So thank you. All right, take care. <laughs> All right, take Peter. care. Bye-bye. Hey, what I'm going to do now is I, I really appreciated his his vantage points. Yeah, I really did. Um, but we're going to do a couple of the things that we needed that we with that we're gonna do. We you know it was I Mother's it Day. I guess it was. It was it was Sunday. And, it was uh, Sunday. So you know we were. Um, we've got a giveaway. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do is we're going to announce... Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to announce the winners. The first winner... And notice what we said was first. Yes. The first winner is actually... Um, I've got to actually get the name of the young lady... But because she's got a business name up here, but it's first step learning. So I'm going to have to actually get the name of the owner so we can actually get it to her. One of the bags. Um, so I want y'all to see all this prettiness my sister did. Like, you know, this is a little, see my sister put all this together because, you know, she's. She's the creative one. Can y'all see that bow? Yeah, they're gorgeous. <laughs> but I mean, like these bags are, are no joke. Like she, she's. We've got all kinds of goodies in these doggone bags, and yeah. so and so she's from Mississippi. She's in Meridian, Meridian, Meridian Mississippi. Mississippi. Yeah, Meridian, Mississippi. And then so the other one that actually we appreciate, you know, because we had several people that actually shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was and I'll let you do the honors. So the second person is our very own lovely little sister, Miss Kiana. So Miss Kiana, yeah, okay, yeah, you know we in the process of chaos, so we need to get connected with you real quick, <laughs> so we can get this to you. And and we thank you so much for, and we thank everyone, but you know for for just your support for being here with us for making it a point to to share a portion of your of your time and, well, and she's like no 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 and to just <laughs> and to just you know like I say absolutely just just all love um and we thank everyone who takes the time from their day to you know from their evening just to to spend with us and to watch our posts to share our posts to really just kind of connect with what it is that we're doing. Um, we are, you know, a part of what we do, um, the part of this show, you know, education, entertainment, empowerment, enlightenment. Um, and enlightenment, because, you know, it's always, it's always good to say, here's a different point of view. 
for you to think about. Mm -hmm. Here's some information that you can take with you to help you build yourself, your, you know, your, your business, your, your just, just, just grow as a person. Mm -hmm. So these are all the things that we purposefully do with this show. And uh, little sister, you cannot tell me no. I don't know why people like telling me no. What the hell is well, that Well, she had actually inboxed and was like, no, 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 no. She said the same thing. It was all love. It's just support. But and honey, it is all love and support, you know, coming from this from this angle too. Matter of fact, I love your show the other night. I oh, really enjoyed yes. I really enjoyed just like listening to you talk. Yes. Um, so for those who don't know, if you could please, if you came in late, go back to the very beginning of the show. Um, and watch the clip from Kiana. Uh, Kiana is our our little sister, our mentee, our you know. And when I tell you that is a bad little lady, I, oh my god, she's she's absolutely incredible. So don't no 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 me. I don't know <laughs> why y'all think that is a thing. Y'all, I don't know why people like telling me no. Like that is just I have nothing to do. With that, that is so not a thing that y'all get to do. Don't tell me no. What the hell? Anyway, so <laughs> so to Miss Kiana, uh, we will see you soon. To the owner of First Steps Learning, we will be in contact to get your information so that we can send you your 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 gifts. Yes, little well, now she's like, thank you, my love. We love you all, and we appreciate you all, and we thank you for joining us on this thing called. Life. life next week Ooh. oh yes honey yes next week's show yes we going wait a minute let me take my glasses off of this one co-parenting with a twist oh when y'all get these twists no we're i mean this is going to be one that you really won't expect well, I know my own co-parenting story. So yeah, I know that this is this is 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 going to be a really amazing show. But I know also know that I'm gonna probably drink some cup of tea during that one because I think that it's probably going to It's gonna be an emotional show. It's going to be an emotional show. But I think because again, you know, knowing my own experiences and knowing how we progressed and, and whatnot. So But we're going to talk about um, co-parenting and doing it the right way. Yes. We're going to yes. talk about co-parenting and doing it the right way. And it's going to get intense because it's going to get intense. Honey, I'm ready. Let me, uh, like I said, I'm going to have some kava tea on deck. Cause... Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a very special guest on that week. We are. News yep. to me, uh, I told you who the young lady we know. Her. Oh yeah, yes, but yes. Then there's a couple out of Mississippi that's supposed <gasps> to be. Um, Yay! Oh love. So love, love, love. So I'm excited. So yes, it's about time. Right. So I can't wait for you all to see the promo for next week's show. Absolutely, because we're going to talk about co-parenting with a twist, and we know it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you have toxic parents that are part of the mix. How do you get beyond the toxic? How do you get beyond the toxic? Cancel culture, honey. You know what? I'm just saying. On that note, have a wonderful week and we appreciate you for joining us on this thing called Life. Take care, everybody.